Good morning, everyone. My name is Pamela Robinson. I'm the Interim Academic Director of City Building Ryerson, which is our new university-wide initiative to mobilize and showcase city building and urban innovation at Ryerson University. My co-moderator today is Amy Yan. Amy is a fourth year student at the Ryerson School of Interior Design. During her time in this program, she's worked on multiple cross-disciplinary research projects that have been showcased at the Interior Design Show and the Gladstone Hotel's Come Up to My Room exhibition. Amy is interested in the intersections of design and storytelling. Welcome, Amy, and thank you for making time to join us at this busy time of the year. Before we begin, I'd like to confirm our recognition that Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon territory is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee people that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of friendship, peace and respect. Before we begin the webinar, a few pieces of housekeeping. We're gonna begin with our presenters research presentation followed by a moderated question and answer session. This should take about 30 minutes. After this, you're welcome who, if you'd like to, to stick around and participate in our deep dive session for the back end 30 minutes, where you'll be able to ask questions um, to our research team directly. Your microphones and cameras will be turned off during the session, but you're welcome to use the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. And if someone else has asked a question that you think is particularly compelling, please feel free to use the upvote button um, so that you, we can see which questions are of the most interest to our audience. This webinar, along with all of the others in our series, will be recorded and posted on Ryerson City Building website. So now let's begin with the most interesting and important part of what we're doing today. Linda Zhang is an assistant professor at the Ryerson School of Interior Design, and she's a maker, a thinker, and an educator. Her design research and teaching proposes the process of making as a form of cognition and production as a thought. Thinking always translates into making and making into further ideas. Her work explores how material and technology processes can be agents to critically thinking about how culture, meaning, and identity and memory are associated to place. Her design and architecture practice in Studio Pararum is, uh, links techniques of making to felt and embodied experiences. Presented in a celebration of upcoming Asian Heritage Month, this webinar focuses on, on Professor Zeng's innovative and design-based project with the Museum of Toronto with the support of the Ryerson Library Collaboratory that seeks to involve community members in dialogue about the preservation and the evolution of heritage in Toronto's two Chinatown districts. Without further ado, I'm going to turn that webinar over to Linda Zeng. Over to you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's great to be here and I'm very much looking forward to chatting with all of you in the audience um, in the second half of this webinar as well. All right, just bear with me while I share screen. All right, here we go. Um, so I'd also like to begin by just reflecting on the lands um, of Chinatown where um, this, this research is, is being conducted. So Chinatown West is located along Spadina Avenue, which has its roots in the Ojibwe word Ishpadina, which means hill or sudden rise in land. In the mid 18th century, the Anishinaabe peoples camped along what is now the northern end of Spadina Ave. The sudden rise in land provided a strategic vantage point to monitor activity uh, to trade with the French at Fort, at Fort Roy, um, while Chinatown West may be the most well-known Chinatown in Toronto today, there have actually been several Chinatowns on different lands, uh, both in downtown Toronto and in the greater GTA. And while some exist today, others are already displaced. And we'll look at some of those together today. Um, with this history as our shared context, we recognize that anti-displacement work in Chinatown today must also acknowledge the indigenous histories of its lands and work with indigenous peoples to end ongoing violence, dispossession, and displacement. So one such site that has already been displaced um, in Chinatown, or sorry, of the Chinese community in Toronto, um, there's actually a early historic site of the first Chinese neighborhood, not yet a Chinatown. Um, and this was located on York Street, south of Wellington. Um, and following the Great Fire of Toronto, this, was, this area was redeveloped um, for what is now Union Station. And this community was forced to move in the 1910s and 20s uh, to Elizabeth Street on the south side of Queen. And you may all be more familiar with this early Chinatown, also known as Old Chinatown. Um, and 
uh, this is located where today we now have City Hall. So then in 1947, the first Chinatown was expropriated by City Council to make way for new City Hall. Um, so here we can see some historical photographs of the old Chinatown neighborhood. Um, and anything that you see with this kind of barcode tag uh, is coming directly from our City of Toronto archives. So here we see the new International Chop Soy House blueprints, some um, Chinatown organizations and businesses. And then following the construction of new City Hall in the 1960s, Chinatown moved for the third time to its current home along Spadina Avenue and Dundas Street, uh, known as Chinatown West. And then from 1971, a fourth urban Chinatown known as Chinatown East began to emerge at Gerard Street East and Broadview Avenue, um, largely in response to the unaffordable property values in Chinatown West. So in contrast to earlier years of expropriation, Chinatown East and West have become uh, now economic desirable sites of tourism. And so today, both sides have received support from the city reflecting Canada's changing attitude towards immigration and multiculturalism on a national scale. So passed on January 21st, 1980, zoning bylaw number 9980 amended the official plan for the city of Toronto and designated a portion of Chinatown West as an area of special identity, which encouraged the provisions of decorative elements to complement the emerging Chinese motif, which is the term we'll come back to. Um, and this here is defined as illuminated signs, street furniture, and architectural detail. Meanwhile, in Chinatown East on September 12th, 19, sorry, 2009, <laughs> the city celebrated the opening of Toronto's first Zhonghua Min Archway. And this was a 10 year joint project between the city of Toronto and the Chinese community, including the Chinese government as well. Um, yet at the same time in 2017, the city of Toronto's art and public donation policy expressly excluded commemorative um, ethnocultural donations. Um, and they did this by requiring that work must feature a significant contribution from Canadians or be an event that occurred in Canada. Um, so specifically it states uh, for commemorative donations, the theme of the uh, proposed work must feature a significant contribution from Canadians or be an event occurred in Canada. If the event uh, the donor wishes to commemorate neither occurred in Canada nor primarily features Canadian, then the event being commemorated must be officially recognized by the government of Canada. Um, so there's actually, uh, this is part of a longer history, which we'll get into today, about what is allowed to occupy public space and a certain model for social cohesion and unity um, that at times is at odds with what is valued by a certain community way of life. Um, and so we can see, uh, you know, this 2017 policy, you know, echoed in, in many decades past uh, around other debates in Chinatown um, around what we recognize in public space. And so there's sort of these conflicting and um, policies and guides, but also just a, a, a complexity and yet richness um, in terms of how do we foster inclusive and diverse heritage practices in Canada's multicultural context. And so at the center of this for me is the question of who is allowed to occupy public space, who gets to decide this, who, by whom, for whom. Um, so in the next bit, we're gonna kind of look at how do we define Chinatownness and who is deciding this and for whom it's being decided. And we're going to look at this specifically through the lens of architecture. So um, we, if we think about the, the city's own words, uh, how do we define a Chinese motif? Um, this maybe is not necessarily what we think about in terms of what we value as a community way of life. Um, sorry, in these images, not, not necessarily this word. Um, and we how do we, you know, what, how can Chinatown relate to what is considered Canadian heritage? You know, how do these two things, which are related, yet seem to also have some oppositions, you know, how do they interface with one another? And, you know, historically, Chinatowns, uh, and they continue to be one of the few globally accepted and acceptable, um, you know, public displays of ethnocultural heritage. Um, however, this is obviously not possible without a fight either, and a lot of um, resilience and adversity. So in Chinatown, uh, we might say that the uh, threat of displacement or expropriation is always present. It is also maybe what in some ways makes Chinatown what it is today. Um, and so in this project, in this presentation, um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, a, 
research project, which is going to be shortly uh, next month, uh, exhibited as a digital exhibit as part of my Zium Intersections Festival. Um, and it's looking at this question of um, for whom, by whom. Um, and so uh, this is one of the projects pictured here. And just before we uh, get more into this work, I do want to just return to the history of um, our ethnocultural heritage specific to the Chinese community and Chinatown, which is a much larger now Pan-Asian community in North America. So I wanted to start with the first instance that architecture was built by the Chinese community in North America. Um, this is the Chinese Village and Theater Pavilion at the 1893 World's Exposition in Chicago. These World Expos, um, these, these pavilions are typically funded and constructed by the country of origin. But interestingly, in this case, this pavilion was not. So just one year before the expo, the US extended the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1892. Um, so the Qing government actually withdrew its support from the Chicago Exposition, and funding was actually provided instead by a group of Chinese Americans. Um, and so I want to just zoom out for a moment to sort of understand why they felt the need to self-fund this project. Um, and so the Chicago Exposition was actually nicknamed the White City. And this was for its master plan design featuring buildings of uniform height, style, and color. We can see that in the image on the bottom right. Um, and the architectural design was being used in a literal and figurative way to promote a certain model for social cohesion as well as uniformity in the US at that time. Um, and the, however, you know, the Chinese American um, did not fit into this uniform model, neither does Chinatown today, um, and nor did in fact the Chinese village and theater. And so on the right side of this plan, um, we can actually see there's this sort of uh, street that's growing out of it. Um, this is actually called the Midway. And this is where everyone who did not fit into the white city was placed. Um, and so it was actually, in fact, almost quite literally arranged from black to white. So two German and two Irish villages were located nearest to the white city. And then further away were villages representing the Middle East, West Asia, and East Asia. And here's a red dot showing where the Chinese village and theater was placed. And then you can see the colorful uh, image on the left um, featuring a sort of like almost carnival like attraction site of true sort of cultural adventure tourism is, is what was, you know, acceptable in this space. So the intent of the pavilion was actually to correct prejudice from European Americans against the Chinese to gain broader acceptance within the mainstream society. Um, and the architecture of the pavilion was, a, was an opportunistic and strategic way to use loose imitations of ancient Chinese architecture uh, to make Chinese forms more palatable and easily digestible uh, to these European American audience, uh, albeit with the lens of continued colonialism. And so we see this playing out across Chinatowns uh, and the Canada and the US. And so uh, famously in, in San Francisco, um, following the 1906 earthquake, which devastated one of North America's earliest Chinatowns, um, the city didn't offer to uh, support for rebuilding Chinatown. It actually saw this as an opportunity to replace it with Daniel Burnham's 1905 plan for San Francisco. This was also known as the City Beautiful movement. And this is actually the same architect as the White City. And this City Beautiful movement came out of this. So there's an idea of beautification, of uniformity, of cohesion as a sort of social ideal uh, of which Chinatown is you know, never fitting into. Um, and so we can see the sort of before and after. Um, and interestingly, um, what has resulted here is that in order to rebuild um, and be able to stay, the Chinese community actually strategically hired a team of white architects led by Bernard Maybeck to design and build a Chinatown that was distinctly Chinese that actually all Americans could appreciate um, or understand and enjoy or consume. So much like uh, the Chicago World's Expo, and these architects that were hired to design um, this consumable um, and acceptable Chinatown had never been to China before. They instead mistranslated Chinese architectural elements and motifs uh, to make something, again, more digestible. And this is actually what has now formed what we know and love today about Chinatown. And it's taken on many different meanings, um, of course, over, over the century um, until today. 
And so actually in Toronto, just two years before the San Francisco earthquake was the 1904 Great Fire of Toronto, and that destroyed the first Chinese neighborhood um, in Toronto. And of course, as we know, this was not rebuilt um, in Toronto and residents were forced to move. Um, and so then again, even in 19... 47, even though the architectures that were built in Old Chinatown in Toronto were, you know, playing on many of these stereotypes um, and easily digestible forms, um, this was still not enough. And so we can see in the bottom right image, the area of Old Chinatown, which was expropriated to build New City Hall today. Um, so against this legacy of displacement, uh, this the, the work that I'm looking at is trying to reimagine the future heritages of what Chinatown could be um, and wanting to build a kind of more expansive definition of what this model for you know, social cohesion or how we come together could be understood um, more inclusively, more diversely, and questioning this through an architectural lens. So this project began by 3D scanning Toronto's Chinatowns. Um, this is during early lockdown last May. Um, and in the field of architectural preservation, 3D scanning has become the standard technology through which things are documented. Uh, well, it has become increasingly affordable. For example, you can even now do small scale 3D scanning directly from your smartphones with cloud processing. Uh, to 3D scan an entire neighborhood at a usable resolution still remains prohibitive um, for you know, community members. Um, so this means that this is uh, largely something that can only be done at an institutional level. Um, and so that means there is institutions who are um, getting to decide what is deemed worthy of 3D scanning, what is deemed worthy of heritage status, what is deemed worthy of remembering or documenting. Um, and so as this uh, began, um, I just felt a need that, you know, since I am part of an institution, I have institutional support. Um, the 3D scanning of this was supported also through the Ryerson uh, Library Collaboratory. Um, one of the things that was important to me was that uh, I document Chinatown. Um, I decide that I want to document it. Uh, it needs to be documented and I will do this every year for the next 10 years. Um, so that was sort of the first part um, of how the project began. Uh, but one of the immediate concerns uh, right after is then, okay, we have all this 3D data, so what? Um, how, this, this, is, this data is also not accessible um, to community members uh, or everyday visitors. And so um, beyond just being able to store this data, um, how do we actually uh, put this in the hands of people? How do we give agency in the process? Um, and so that's sort of where the project then um, has many uh, forms of ex exploration around this question. So here we see the 99 buildings of Chinatown East. Um, and so one of the first things that we did was we just 3D printed them all. Um, so we 3D printed each building and we turned them into a board game. Um, so this is the Build Your Own Chinatown board game. Uh, and it's a two player game. And so each board only fits about uh, 10 to 12 buildings, depending how, on how large they are. And so in playing the game, it actually sparks a dialogue, not only internally about in, what's important, but also with someone else who undoubtedly has a different opinion from you. And you have to actually negotiate together um, what is worth um, preserving and remembering. Uh, so it's not only for you to reflect, but also for you to have a tough conversation with someone else um, to, to actually have a, a kind of collective um, and shared dialogue. And then on the other hand, as visitors finish playing the game, a docent is available to teach them how to use a 3D scanner. And so they 3D scan their future Chinatown uh, game board that they played. And, and this is an act of also putting this preservation technology into the hands um, of everyday people. And from these 3D scans, um, we've actually then um, created an, an art installation where um, we have cast their versions of the future of Chinatown uh, in porcelain to sort of make them precious and give them value. Um, and then these are added to this scaffold structure. So the scaffold structure is actually um, made from a 3D scan of the Chinatown East Gate. And the idea behind this is that in some ways, um, these gate structures are uh, in this kind of historical uh, lineage of something that's easily represented, is maybe monolithic, um, sometimes tokenizing, um, 
though still allowed to occupy public space. And so this kind of uh, legacy of this type of um, historic representation uh, is then taken over by a co-constitution of all of the voices of everyone who's played this game. So here you can see the porcelain pieces starting to overtake uh, this scaffold, a scaffold structure. Um, this is currently on exhibit at Griffin Art Projects in Vancouver um, in a large uh, collective um, exhibition titled Who's Chinatown, um, who that brings together many, many different Canadian artists across time um, that have been looking at the site of Chinatown. And so the idea of kind of eventually as people keep playing this game, the whole structure will just simply be taken over um, by these shared visions. Uh, we are currently working on digitizing this game so that it can be played uh, while we physically can't be together right now during um, this pandemic. Uh, and we are uh, aiming to launch this also as part of Museum Intersections Festival coming up next month. Um, and on the other hand, um, another form of digital engagement um, of these 3D scans that I'm exploring um, is virtual reality. And so the world depicted here is based on a short fiction story uh, written by Evelyn, Evelyn Lam about Chinatown in 2050, which was part of a workshop that we um, led last uh, May. And it's the architectural environment you see here is made by recollaging 3D scans from today's Chinatown East and West um, in, to represent the imagined speculative Chinatown um, in Evelyn Lamb's story. Um, and so this workshop actually emerged in the context of COVID-19. Um, so last April was when uh, we were supposed to exhibit the Museum Intersections Festival project. It was obviously postponed um, until this May. And uh, during that time, um, we were asked if we wanted to put together any other virtual programming uh, in, in lieu of the postponement. And in dialogue with all of the um, co-facilitators, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was to put together a workshop that would allow for a moment of expansion um, for this community. It was at a time when how um, Asian Canadians and Chinese Canadians were being represented in the media was very, very narrowing. It was also at a time of heightened anti-Asian sentiment. Um, and so the workshop that we put together here, our, our wonderful facilitators, um, was a speculative fiction wor writing workshop, which would reimagine Chinatown in 2050. And here we can see some of the collective world building um, from within the workshop. Now, during this workshop, the questions that we asked uh, folks to consider were all centered around change. Um, so they were all centered around how things might change uh, by 2050. Um, and so we can see some of those questions here. Who seeks change? Who seeks to prevent change? Are there others in the world seeking different kinds of change? Um, and so these are um, what is centered in, in these voices. And, and this workshop was open to community members. Um, and from there, uh, we now have an anthology of 11 short fiction stories, um, all of which imagine a completely uh, different Chinatown future, and of which um, Amy Yan, who is our moderator today, also has a story written in here as well. And alongside each story, we've also um, produced a virtual reality companion. Um, and so, um, for example, here is the virtuality companion for Amy's story, which is uh, titled Chinatown Island, um, where she has imagined that by 2050, um, Chinatown has become socially distanced from Toronto and is now located on Chinatown Island and has become to some to some degree, a site of tourist uh, attractions. Here we see the CN Tower, and on the other side, we see a gigantic lucky cat structure poking through the trees. Um, but at the same time, in her story, the main character is also navigating some of the interior spaces and interiority of Chinatown, um, which do provide spaces for community way of life. And so through her writing, she's negotiating between um, what is outwardly facing in terms of public, um, public space, public space occupation and heritage, um, as opposed to um, how that is needed in order to uh, give way to a community way of life and give space. Um, so all of this is uh, going to be part of the Museum Intersections Festival in uh, 2021. I encourage you all to um, check that out. Alongside this are also um, four other 
uh, pro projects from 16 students from the School of Ryerson Interior Design that are interior design projects. Uh, also looking at this question of 3D scanning um, and how to use that in a way to give agency um, and for storytelling. Um, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to chatting. Linda, thank you so much for that super engaging presentation. I had this moment about two minutes ago where I realized I hadn't checked the Q&A. Um, and I think the audience, the participants are probably in the same boat I am, which is I was so enthralled by what you were saying, I wasn't entering questions. So uh, before I turn it over to Amy to ask the first question, uh, we've got a really big group of people who um, just had the huge pleasure of listening. So you can start to populate your questions in the Q&A and we'll go to you soon. Amy, I'm gonna give you the first question, okay? Over to you. Sure, um, so my first question is, um, Chinatown West, um, as you mentioned in your presentation, is designated as an area of special identity by the city of Toronto, um, but the exact atmosphere that this like, designation protects are never really explicitly or necessarily meaningfully um, defined beyond like Chinese motif. Um, so how have you seen the collective act of our, us building our own Chinatowns through the board game and even like the other offshoot pro like projects like the story, Let's check the future and stories, um, be able to define the special identity for ourselves within the community? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that that's the research question too, right? Um, so one of the things is, I think it's very clear um, in, in writing that provision of uh, encouraging the emerging Chinese motif um, that whoever wrote that <laughs> has no idea what it should be, right? Um, sometimes if I put on like my like lawyer hat, I think like, oh, like what was the person thinking and intending by writing this? Like what were they legally trying to, you know, accomplish? Um, and honestly, it's probably just that there isn't, there, especially, you know, um, in 1971, like there, there wasn't, there wasn't much context or research that had been done around these questions or there wasn't there's nothing that exists to really give guidance to this um and so it but it falls into a long history of how things have been framed um for over a century now and so with all of the projects that um we're working we're working on that Amy is also on the project team and a major part of um, it's a question of actually like if you were to ask me what should be written into the zoning bylaw right now for this I couldn't answer you and I don't think that I should be able to answer you immediately and and no right like it's all of these forms of engagement now are participatory and they're trying to bring to together a collection of voices which actually generally all disagree with each other. Um, the Chinatown uh, community is extremely heterogeneous and what people from the community want for the future is completely at odds with each other almost all the time. And I think that um, that makes it difficult within this sort of like traditional model of heritage where we just sort of choose one building and choose the most authentic time period to restore it to. Um, it doesn't fit within that. We don't have heritage practices that are able to deal with the complexity for a site like Chinatown. Um, and so what the work is trying to do is to both find new relational processes and practices that put differing views and opinions and desires together and find a different structure for how we can allow and sit in impasse um, and not try to overcome it, um, but allow it to, um, you know, sit with the richness of that. But at the other um, side of things, it's also to uh, give, to also like listen to these voices um, that haven't been heard and try to see what we're actually hearing from it. Are there actually patterns and trends that emerge from, from what the, these community members who are participating are saying? And we're starting to see some of those now and there's a lot more um, people to engage and voices to hear before you know, we, we move um, forward and, and draw any conclusions. It, you know, and even the conclusions wouldn't be conclusions in this sort of traditional um, social cohesion uniformity model. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's trying to expand how we define things, try, which is both the methodologies of how we define things, but also seeking out new definers for things. Um, so whom we're asking to participate in the process of defining things. Thank you, Linda. I'm just going to note to everyone who's participating, the formal part of this is now coming. It's 1130. We're just going to keep going. Questions are starting to roll in, which I'm very excited to get 
um, get to Linda. But for those of you, we're going to kind of switch over to active Q and A right away. Um, so Linda, I'm going to go in the order that they're arriving, uh, and then other people can start to add in. So one of our participants asks, since many of the older generation of Chinese immigrants still live in or around uh, the many clan in place uh, associations in West Chinatown, do you have thoughts and plans about how to reimagine these spaces that historically and presently provide community and placemaking and how can they be reimagined? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we have an upcoming project, which is a larger, um, maybe I'd say, two to four year project um and that it, that's really actually something that we want to look at um and so so far uh, a lot of our um uh so far in general vr is not that accessible in terms of being able to design things in, in vr and visualize things um, if you're not trained and have a skill set as a designer. Um, so an upcoming project is uh, in partnership with Protect at Ryerson um, is about developing methodologies for both collective VR, so a VR space where we can all be in there together. Um, that's There's both uh, virtually like that, but also physical VR spaces where you can be 12 people together in a VR space when social distancing permits. Um, and in this project, we're actually trying, we're, we're going to basically make the game into a VR game where you can build your own Chinatown in high definition with detail in VR. And so something like actually trying to reimagine um, these uh, like associations um, and clan spaces uh, that's something that then you could actually directly come into this VR space and we could have a dialogue where like, what do you imagine? What do you, what, what would you need? What would that look like? And sometimes it's about, sometimes it's really about like, you talk about an object for a tangible thing to actually get to an intangible need or an intangible value. Um, so the whole thing is centering around talking about the built form, but it's actually a, about not about that it's really about a community way of life um and so in being able to do this the, the hope is then uh, we're also you know doing a lot of research into how do we make this technology also accessible for um older generations and our chinatown seniors as well um, but it would be our desire in, in this next phase to actually then um, engage different um needs groups within chinatown one including seniors and this could be an amazing space to actually be able to ask, like, what would you envision um, for the future of these spaces? What do you need? What do you want? Uh, but also, like, give them the tools where they can actually just directly themselves go in and, and visualize that. Because until now, that's always needed to be moderated by an expert. Um, and in that sense, then a lot of people don't have the uh, ability to even visualize some of these things. And I think giving, um, giving representation to it um, is a way to also share with others um, what is needed and to also give voice to those, those questions as well. Um, so stay tuned in the next few years. <laughs> Hi, um, so I'll jump into the next question, um, which is actually one of my own, but um, so I was just wondering, so this question kind of comes from more from the lens of interior design as I am an interior design student, but um, this project has focused a lot on the exterior and the kind of larger urban in interior of Chinatown. And I know this was sort of a project at the very, uh, like sort of a part of the project at the very beginning, but is there a plan to kind of reincorporate the interiors of Chinatown and perhaps like the smaller scale um, back into the project? Yeah, I think one of the, the, so the reason we started with exterior 3D scanning is that from the exterior, we're in public space. Um, so the only permissions you need are I'm a licensed drone pilot um, and also Transport Canada's permission to fly drones. Um, and so those are needed, but otherwise you're in public space. So you're, you're actually allowed to document that. And those are also the, the outer facing parts which are allowed to occupy public space. I think what's been really interesting in working through the Chinatown 2050 stories um, is one of the uh, major themes that emerged is actually about the relationship between what is outwardly facing and what is inwardly facing um, and the importance of interior spaces as well. Um, we didn't start with the interior documentation because of course, uh, I think there's a lot of ethical questions around, well, if you don't document all of the, every single interior of every single building, um, what is the ethics around which ones get chosen to be documented and which ones are left out? Um, and part of that is also, you know, you need permission from every single 
store owner um, that you would enter into their space to document and they might not want that um, to happen. And so there is then this sort of um, inequity in terms of where we would have data for. So there's there's a lot of, I think, um, important questions that need to be researched even just before beginning um, that kind of a project. Uh, but it's definitely on on the horizon. Yeah. OK, Linda, this picks up a little bit, but it's not exactly the same question. One of our participants talks about how the 3D scanning only reflects the building, but notes that the character of Tr Toronto's Chinatown isn't about the building. It comes in other layers. Are there other ways to integrate this recognition, documentation, and celebration into the 3D modeling? Yeah, so I think that's sort of what the Chinatown 2050 project is about too. And, and this is, I think, what I meant by like, when we talk about an object, we're kind of talking about something else. So like just by looking at, you know, one building, like we looked at the Chinese village and theater, um, there's so much historical context there that really unpacks and helps us understand, you know, why it looks that way and, and what was the purpose of it and why it was built that way. Um, so there's a story behind, you know, every single building. So that's that's part of, part of you know, um, there's a great phrase that was written by um, what the, the author who wrote the foreword for the book, um, Jeremy G, and he wrote, um, oh, now I'm gonna blank where I was going with this. He wrote something, um, Oh, I just lost my train of thought. Give me one moment. Thanks for all your patience. Um, uh, shoot, what was the question? Can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, I, I think what the question this. was getting at is that like the 3D technology allows you to get the building envelope and like the built form, but that there's more to the history of Chinatown than just the structure oh, of the buildings. Yes. Yeah. His amazing quote was, um, Chinatown is an, an illuminating uh, history of the diasporas of its community for those who know how to see it. Um, and it's just this really wonderful phrase. And I think it's so true uh, in many ways. And I think it's often difficult to talk about, you know, uh, sometimes like the politics of Chinatown and people will say, will tend to um, shy away from it and, and, and also kind of position it as like opinion based and, and not necessarily um, value it in, in the same way. But when we talk about the built environment, it's literally, it's built there, it is there. Those were its intentions, that's why it was built. Um, it actually can tell us a story um, and we actually have to acknowledge its presence um, and the fact that these were historical events that did happen and there were reasons why and they were tied to also social, cultural, political, economic reasons. Um, and so uh, then uh, the question is, you know, beyond just documenting the exteriors, there's a lot like a, a lot of the research really is asking the question that you're asking as well, which is, you know, what do we do with these scans afterwards? Um, and how can and how, like we, we know that they are these these sort of objects which can tell stories, but how do we help everybody to be able to know how to see it? Um, and so how do we kind of do a bit of that translation work uh, to make them more accessible, to put them into the hands of people, to both give people agency, but also to use them for storytelling. Um, and so the Chinatown 2050 um, book project, the VR Companion is very much about taking these scans and then re-collaging them. And so all, each space is totally different and completely you know, speculative and fictional um, and re-puts them together in a new way to help us see something else. Um, and then meanwhile, from, you know, a, a more maybe pure interior design context, um, there are four um, installations that were physical installations now being digitally exhibited that are part of the Museum Intersections Festival. Um, and this was part of a fourth year studio at the School of Interior Design. And in each of these projects, the students were given the 3D scans and they were also given um, a, a lot of archival material and they were asked to make an interior space from these 3D scans that would actually tell a story of one of these sites. And so it was sort of a question of like, how can 3D scans be used in interior design to actually convey value, to convey meaning, to um, actually kind of like elicit something beyond just the literal scan. So in those designs, the scans are um, often manipulated and then obviously translated into physical form, whether you know it's fabric, it's metal, it's um, 
you know, uh, it's, you know, a, a printed. Um, so th there are very, very many different explorations. And so I think it's, it's this question of like, typically we use 3D scans to just re like it, it's done by an institution, like UNESCO decides, and then we just perfectly reconstruct whatever it looked like as it was. Um, and that model for heritage comes from a legacy of um, mostly European enlightenment values um, and also design European design ideals for good design is clear, it's uniform, it's uh, cohesive, right? And so um, all of that tends to uh, not leave room for a lot of things of value in other communities. Um, and so there is also a question, there's also a question of like, you know, in using these 3D scans to make new and speculative and literal physical interior spaces, there's a question of like, how should we be using this historic records and this data? And is there a different way and a different approach that we could take um, to try to, you know, bring together some of these intangible elements um, and especially lived uh, experience. I think a lot of the work um, really focuses on, you know, what is the atmosphere of a space? What is the affect of it? We talk a lot about affect theory and a lot about like, how does a space make you feel? And that lived experience as something that's actually valuable. And that's something that's actually a very valuable form of embodied knowledge. And that should be a type of knowledge that is as important as analytical thinking. Um, and so those are also, you know, parts of how do we elicit some of those things um, through this technology. About eight things I want to loop back to you on, but our Q&A box is filling up. So Amy, over to you. Um, thanks, Pamela. So the next question um, is, given uh, the total resource availability, what is your dream collaboration with the community of Chinatown? Ooh. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm already getting to do that. I feel very honored and privileged to be able to work in, in this space. Um, we have an upcoming project with uh, T-Base um, that is also using this collective VR technology, which will be um, for next year around reimagining the anti-displacement garden and, and doing some both gardening um, and also, you know, terracotta planter fabrication um, with community members and, and having a dialogue around, you know, what does anti-displacement mean for Chinatown and for who. Um, and so I, I yeah, I'm very grateful to just be here um, and be able to do work with these um, community members. Um, for those of those of you who don't already know me a bit more, um, in my background, I did grow up um, in Ontario, but I've been gone for about 10 years and came back in 2018, but never lived in Toronto, though we would always drive many hours to do groceries here um, because there was no Chinese groceries uh, where I grew up. Um, and so in many ways, I also see myself as a newcomer uh, to this community, even though I have um, lots of connections to it and it has many meanings to me um, as well. And so I'm just uh, grateful to be able to, you know, use the skill set that I have to try to contribute um, to expanding, you know, how, how we um, can understand the future of this kind of community and this, this neighborhood. Okay, Linda, the next question comes from someone who identifies themselves as Chinese Canadian. And they ask about their other Chinese Canadian friends who aren't engaged in or as passionate about the future of Chinatown. How do you imagine a future for this class of future seniors? What if they don't need Chinatown or they're not interested in it or the other geographies of belonging? And what if they have a renewed interest but wanna shape it beyond what we presently understand to be Chinese at all? Thank you for a great presentation, they write. Um, it's such a great question. Um, there was a hilarious moment in one of the speculative fiction stories where the author wrote about the millennial seniors, because of course the millennials are seniors by 2050, but I just had never, um, hadn't thought about millennials being seniors yet uh, until uh, that moment. And I was like, yes, very, like, exactly. Um, and I do think, you know, um, these things are always changing, you know, Ch Chinatown, exists very much between generations um, and you know whether that's like one two three or five fifth generation you know there's so many um, and and there's also these these large 
spaces in between each generation and, and their understandings of what um, Chinatown sort of needs to be. Uh, and it's always evolving. It's always also evolving in terms of what the city wants Chinatown to be or you know, how Chinatown can fit into mainstream society. Those things are always evolving as well. Um, and so I think, like I, I always see Chinatown as, as somewhat something that is both a resistance, but something that also persists within a space where it's not supposed to be. Um, so all of the factors will keep changing. And also like what with from internally, like what the community wants Chinatown to be or what or needs Chinatown to be is also always going to keep changing. And like what you're um, asking is completely a totally plausible possible future. Um, and it could be something else, you know, entirely than we see it now. And this is really why, you know, such provisions like Chinese motif encouragement um, are not helpful. <laughs> um, and we, we need other, you know, forms of structuring those. Um, I'd actually love to read a speculative fiction that you might write about this future case scenario for Chinatown. <laughs> Um, so the next question actually asks about um, kind of keeping updated with the progress. So I think I might leave that question for the end, but so I'm going to move on to the other question from our participant who's asking, um, how are you also working with community groups that are advocating for the historical preservation and future of Vancouver's Chinatown? If so, do you see similar aspirations and challenges that parallel with Toronto's Chinatowns? Yeah, um, so that's a, I would actually love to become more involved with um, groups in other cities in Chinatown. Um, that's been one of the really amazing parts of being part of the Griffin Art Project's Who's Chinatown exhibition. So in a number of panels where I've um, got to meet a lot of these amazing people, you know, in doing work in Vancouver's Chinatown, you know, Edmonton, Calgary, um, you know, all across Montreal, all across the country. Um, and there is definitely a lot of similar, um, and parallel both aspirations and events across Canada and the US, at least in Chinatowns, um, because much of what's happened in Chinatown coincides directly with immigration reform, um, as well as with, you know, broad sweeping infrastructural urban planning practices. Um, so it it's uh, it's uncanny how similar the story of every Chinatown is. Um, and there's a lot that we can learn from each other. I probably currently have more connections to New York uh, Chinatown um, than, than I do other Canadian Chinatowns, um, just coming back to Canada recently. Um, but that's definitely something that, yeah, I, I see as really valuable to continue you know, building on and learning from. Um, in New York Chinatown, they had this amazing project from the city group where um, the community developed their own proposal for a zoning plan uh, to for Chinatown for its to protect its future for the community. Um, they've been trying to get it implemented by the city of New York. Obviously, uh, that has not ha been adopted and happened. Um, but what they did do is they made this public call um, to architects, just any architects, to help visualize the difference between what the city is proposing for the zoning over the next 10 years and what their plan proposes. So people can actually see if we follow the, like these these regulations, which you know, for someone who's not an expert in this field, um, are hard to understand um, and visualize and know why it's actually so um, important or impactful or dangerous. Um, it's hard to see that. And so there was this amazing project where they just went through and for each site visualized the worst possible outcome that's allowed by what the city is proposing and the um, the best possible outcome in terms of what is encouraged by the uh, community plan but in in that one it's actually like they're trying to build it actually like if a developer came in came in and tried to game their their zoning even what would be allowed as you know a possible outcome so it's even it's even somewhat like the worst possible outcome in both cases um, and just to be able to see what that looks like um, and i think it was largely powerful to realize like oh like do you really want manhattan chinatown to be just completely taken over by these like 80 story skyscrapers um, and not have any affordable housing and you know not have these community spaces anymore. Um, and so I think there's like, I thought that was like an amazing project uh, and there's all these amazing, amazing people doing such incredible work around town of towns globally. Um, so I think there's, yeah, there's a lot that we can learn from each other and support each other um, through. 
Okay, next question comes from my awesome colleague, Juicy Zhuang uh, from the School of Urban and Regional Planning. Uh, Juicy writes, uh, thank you so much, Linda, for your fascinating presentation. You raised a critical question about the future of Chinatown, by whom and for whom. Considering the complexity of place and the hyperdiversity of its users, are you considering any of the following topics in your future research, including intergenerational perspectives, Chineseness, commercialization, and decolonialization? Yeah, those are all definitely questions that are at the forefront and center of, of the research. Um, I think, you know, currently the work has um, mainly engaged young people because um, that's sort of within this sort of art realm, um, the, the population that's most accessible. Uh, so a, a major part of the next phase of the project around this kind of collective VR uh, project is around um, intergenerational dialogues um, and also really trying to reach um, the, like the senior population and also put them in dialogue with uh, people who are from other generations and, and the sort of younger community that has a very different opinion um, than, than they have and trying to kind of um, using the sort of same frame relational frameworks that we've been working with, um, trying to put those voices yeah, together. Great. Um, so we have another participant that asks, also thinking about Chinese Canadian seniors, example, um, for grandparents, for example, and family associations, and thinking about how these spaces are changing functionally as their meaning and relevance changes across generations. Um, can, uh, and how many of these changes, um, and how many of these changes have been accelerated by COVID? Wondering more about how co connecting with these generations and their experience, and how. Um, and are other existing efforts and have you connected with them? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the impact of um, COVID on long-term uh, care facilities in Chinatown was, um, you know, very detrimental. Um, and it was, uh, it's been a very difficult time. Um, I think the impact of COVID on Chinatown, um, in some ways, while uh, I think has been very difficult, I also don't think is unique. Um, it happened during SARS. It was the exact same responses and reactions um, in terms of loss of business, people, um, how people um, see the community. Um, the legacy of seeing Chinatown and its residents as agents of infectious disease, this phrase is what was said you know, in the 1890s. Um, around Chinatown. It's why they didn't want to rebuild San Francisco Chinatown. Um, so the, these kinds of, uh, you know, just like colonial views of people of color um, have a really long legacy and are systemic um, and are uh, still pervasive. Uh, of course, COVID has brought out um, and exacerbated, uh, put a magnifying glass on some of these questions, um, but they've never really gone away. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, I, while I, yeah, while I, I agree of, in terms of the acceleration, I think you totally used the right word, like acceleration um, by COVID, because these are also, you know, not new questions. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the seniors is, is, is a, a demographic we haven't, um, we have not engaged much um, as of yet, uh, but also as a result, realize we need to engage more. I think one of the hopes, I think one of the issues is that we went digital um, very early on into this project, just the pandemic. Um, originally this program and this exhibition was all supposed to be hosted at Cecil Community Center. Um, and we were supposed to do actually programming for both uh, seniors within that community space, as well as toddlers and children. Um, and so, I think having being actually in physical space, um, there's a way in which you actually can just reach a lot more people than like the people who'd want to join on a Zoom event um, right now and have the luxury to and who have a laptop and high speed internet at home. Um, and so there's a way in which as a result of uh, the timing of things, uh, we haven't reached the same um, audience that we had hoped to reach. And I think that's also where the kind of VR project emerges from, um, which is sort of recognizing the space that we're in and that this kind, these kinds of spaces will also continue um, both well after the pandemic, but also well into however long it takes us to eventually return and in our hybrid forms, um, thinking about, you know, how do we actually make these forms of engagement 
um, accessible to all community members um, across generations um, and, and just also like technological access and the digital divide. Um, and so, yeah, these are questions that have become um, even more important now as a result of being online um, than they were before, where just by being in a space where you know other people are, you would immediately have access to conversations with people. Um, and so that's something that uh, we've lost a bit during, during this time um, and are kind of looking for new ways um, to sort of bridge that. Okay, we've got one last question for you, Linda, before we wrap up, and it comes from Elena Bird. Elena writes, thank you for this excellent presentation and dialogue today. Do you think Chinatown in Toronto would benefit from the same protection and support as San Francisco's cultural district program? What are the opportunities and challenges of cultural districts in retaining and celebrating the intangible cultural heritage and community identity in cities? Yeah, I, I, I always, my, my, my like phrase to this would be like, everything comes at a cost. Um, so there's no, you don't gain anything without losing something. Um, and so one way forward, you know, is something like the cultural district program. Um, but the cost of that is also, you know, there's a little bit of like disnification or like freezing something in time that should be living. Um, but then, you know, without that, uh, there's also the danger of losing things entirely. Um, so it's always this sort of, uh, balance between you know very delicate <laughs> sort of forms of you know dialogue and resistance uh, uh, among things um i think a lot of uh my work coming from um an architectural background and also even just you know beyond the side of chinatown is looking at heritage um and practices and, and policies uh and looking for ways to reform um how those are understood and thought about um so I wouldn't, I think like I, I wouldn't be opposed to, you know, uh, sort of protection as a cultural district or a heritage site, um, but I would have a lot of opinions about how we define those and would be very critical um, in terms of how those are, you know, kind of traditionally understood and defined um, and be looking for, for sort of other ways of uh, both allowing community voices to be a part of the dialogue in terms of how that is formed, um, but also looking at things that would actually preserve a community way of life, especially those that are at odds with um, what is maybe acceptable within uh, a mainstream um, sort of ideal. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. So we're just about at time. I want to loop back to the question from one of our participants about how can people stay in touch and on top of the work you're doing and if they want to get engaged or participate, what yeah. opportunities are there for our panelists so, or our participants? I'm just throwing a link in the chat. Um, this website is not quite live yet, but if you go okay. to this website, oh, sorry, let me just send it to everybody. I just currently send it to the panelists. Thank you for bearing. You're also patient with me and my uses of technology today. <laughs> Um, all right, here we go. So this one just went out to everybody. Um, and uh, on there, if you want to um, make uh, join a mailing list to pre-order the book, you can. You can get in touch with us. Um, all of the events, upcoming events, are also listed um, on that website, so you can uh, register for things. There's two more events that will be added um, shortly as well. So the digital exhibit is going to be launching on May 20. Third, um, so there'll be soon, it's not up yet, but there'll be a, a Eventbrite and RSVP link through the Myzeum website. Symposium is on the 27th of May, and then we'll have a book launch on June 19th. Um, so all of that information will, um, as it's getting updated, will also uh, all soon be on the website as well. Um, yeah, great. please do reach out. I would love yeah. to hear from anyone who wants to um, get in touch. So really feel free um, to chat. I'm also pretty active on um, Instagram. So if you're into social media, you can also follow me um, on Instagram and I, I will usually post upcoming uh, events there as well. That's great. And on the City Building Ryerson website, when we post the recording of the webinar, we can also include the link so that people can shrink the distance between their interest in being able to get involved. Okay, it's time to wrap up. Uh, I'm gonna start by thanking both Linda and Amy. Thank you both for making time today. Thank you to all of our attendees. Um, this was a really interesting 
there's we could probably go on and on and on. Um, luckily, we'll have the chance to keep on talking, whether it's through these kinds of webinars or hopefully in person. Um, as things become safer and open up. Thank you to the team at City Building Ryerson as always for making this easy um, and also recording this so that we're able to share it with other folks. I wish everybody well, um, stay safe and take care. Thank you for coming, bye. Thank you so much.